connected this morning. Thank you so much for being here and being a guest. If you are a guest with one of our families that, had, uh, that, that went through the dedication today, thank you guys so much for joining them um, and being a part of that special moment. And uh, thank you for trusting, uh, trusting them to trust us to be a part of raising them uh, in a godly way. Uh, we appreciate you guys being here. Um, if you have a Bible, grab it, and, uh, and we're going to go turn to, uh, to your Bible in just a moment. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we have some around on the, on the shelves there, on the railings, uh, but also you can go to your smartphone, um, and you can uh, turn to that as well. Before we jump into today's message, um, I want to tell you that this series called Escape Room has been a blast. <laughs> I don't know um, if you guys have enjoyed it, but... I tell you, I've enjoyed it a ton, and uh, I, every time I've r- written the notes for these, this series, I've cracked myself up. I laugh at my own jokes all the time, and so I think I've laughed more at myself these last four weeks than any other, and so I really, really enjoyed it. But as uh, Pat mentioned, we're wrapping up this series, and we start a brand new series next week called No One Else. And this is going to be the series that's actually going to lead us up into Easter. And uh, the question that we are posing is this, if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? And so the idea is, look, no one else is coming. No one else is, is coming to fix the problems that are in our world. Jesus actually left us, the church, here to be his hands and feet and to help bring some solutions, help bring some, uh, some help to the world that we, uh, that we live in. And so we're going to be diving into our calling as a church, uh, epic church locally here, but also universally, the churches around the world, but then also looking at uh, the, unique, uh, the unique beauty that Jesus has that uh, no one else does and the unique power that Jesus has that no one else does. And uh, today, before you leave, we're actually going to be uh, giving you guys some cards for Easter Sunday which is April 21st, and uh, we're giving you these cards not just to remind you when Easter is, but so that you can remind somebody else when Easter is, and if they don't have a place to worship Easter Sunday, uh, it has all of our information on there. Uh, We've been talking as a leadership team. Uh, Last year, we were just about 700 people on Easter weekend, which was awesome. Um, I would love to break 1,000 this year. A thousand people coming in, worshiping Jesus, learning about who he is and how awesome he is. Uh, that, wouldn't that be fantastic? Anyone think that would be amazing? I, I, some of you guys are thinking about parking and you're like, I don't know if that's going to be good. But man, people come into life in Christ. We got baptisms, live baptisms that day. And so we're going to be baptizing people in the service. Uh, it's such a beautiful thing. If you have not signed up for baptism yet, uh, make sure you do that. There's a class, I believe, after 11 o'clock today. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, the kids are going to have live animals that they're going to be learning the Easter story uh, through. Uh, I don't know how all that works, but they told me there's live animals and they tell the Easter story. And so I said, that's got to be cool. So uh, it's going to be a fantastic weekend. You do not want to miss it. All right, here we go. Escape room. Fourth week of escape room. We're wrapping this up. The whole idea, the premise of this series is about having margin in your life. Margin, as we have been defining it, is this. The space between what you have and what you need. The space between what you have and what you need. And so we first talked about having margin in your time, in your schedule. If you have an hour and it takes you 20 minutes to get to the next place, you have 40 minutes of margin, right? That's between the, the space between what you have and what you need. We talked about having margin in our finances. Last week, we talked about having relational margin, which was uh, we're defining as boundaries, having boundaries between you and another person. Um, that, that message uh, w- was awesome. Well, today, we're going to continue this idea. We're going to be talking about having moral margin. Let's read our, our verse today, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says, look, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. So what you've been tempted by, hey, guess what? Everybody's been tempted by that. From the dawn of time, we've all struggled with the same temptations. The the thing may have changed throughout time, but the temptation is still exactly the same. It's just, look, it's okay. What you're struggling with, we're all struggling with. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape. He will give you escape room when temptation comes so that you may be able to bear it or that you may be able to 
endure it. This Sunday, we're going to be taking this scripture as literally, uh, as uh, more literally than the weeks prior. But we're going to be looking into this idea of being tempted and having some margin in our morals. Let's, uh, let's pray this morning. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, what you've already done in our lives this morning. Lord, I pray that you would continue to stir our hearts. God, speak to us in a way that only you can so that we would leave this room differently than when we came in, closer to you, knowing you in a greater way. We love you, God, and know that you love us. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. There are only two types of people in the world. The type of people that when their gas tank hits about a quarter tank, they say, hey, I need to go get gas. That's one type of people. The other type of people, when the gas light comes on, they say, oh, I'll fill up sometime next week, right? That, who in here is in the first camp? You, you're a little low on gas, and you're like, hey, let me go ahead and stop. Yeah, thank you. These are responsible folks in the room. If you need anything, these are the people we need to look to. Who, who are in the other camp? When the gas light comes on, you're like, ah, I'm good. I'm fine. I have no comment for those of you who have your hands up right now. I love you dearly, and Jesus loves you too. But I cannot live in that type of madness, right? I do, because I'm married to that madness. So I often... When Lori's like, hey, can you run to the store and, you know, get me this, this, this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. She's like, just go ahead and take my car. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not thinking of anything. I get in, the needle's not even, it's not even on the dash anymore. It just fell off. It's down somewhere. And now you have the little digital screen. So I'm like, well, it's going to tell me how many miles I have left before I conk out on the side of the road. It just says refuel. It doesn't even give you a number anymore. It's like. Your, your time is up, you know? She, yes, she is a genius because I go fill up her tank for her. Yes, that is true. You should extend your hands and pray for me because I, I don't know why I continue to fall for this. But uh, I, 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 can't live, I can't live on that, that, that edge of the line. That, that, you know, the mar, there's no margin. There's no margin for error. Yesterday, I was actually driving, and, and I tried it Lori's way. Uh, I, I, my, I was really low on gas, and I, it said I had 30 miles left in my tank. And so I checked my trip, and I, it was about 14 miles from my house to where I was going. And so I thought, hey, this is cool. I've got plenty of time. I'll get gas up there. And so I went, the gas light came on, ding. It didn't tell me how many more miles I had left, but I knew I started with 30. I'm going to end with 14. So I got six, uh, whatever, how many ever else that is, 16. <laughs> Thank you, 16. <laughs> Public school math comes uh, to the rescue. So anyway, I knew I had 16 miles. I could probably go there and get back home. Uh, but after I left, I was wandering around, driving through parking lots, and then I lost track. I didn't know how much I had left. And I thought, man, I'm living on the edge. I can't take it. I broke out in sweats. I didn't know what was wrong. I had to find some gas. I paid $2.75 for some gas. Uh, yeah, I got, I got hammered. That's, I can't live like that. You know what I mean? I want to I talk today about living on the edge, on that edge of margin when it comes to our moral life. Growing up as a kid in church and being in youth groups, the common question that was posed all the time in youth group was, how much can I do and still get into heaven, right? Can I do X, Y, Z and still be saved? Can I do this thing and when I die, I know the Bible says I can't do that thing, but if I do this thing only a little bit, can I still do that and get into heaven? It was the common question that we always ask. Can I do these things and still get into heaven? But I want to talk to you today about this idea. This, this, I want to bring some awareness that we have a very real spiritual enemy that is constantly alluring us and enticing us over to the line. Now, he may not be coming at us with red horns and pitchfork and, and laughing maniacally. <laughs> you know, that, that's not what Satan does. He just entices us closer and closer and closer to the line because he knows that we are human beings and we are frail. And when temptation comes, if we are living on the line, if we are living on the edge, we're going to fall off. And so the enemy is constantly pulling us closer and closer to the line. Like the old uh, boiling a frog analogy. You guys have heard this before, right? If you want to boil a frog, and I don't know why you would ever want to boil a frog. That sounds like so cruel to me. But if that's you and you wanted to boil a frog, 
You're not going to drop the frog into boiling water because as soon as he feels it's hot, he's going to jump right out, correct? But they say if you put the frog in lukewarm water, room temperature water, and you inch up the temperature a little at a time, he doesn't feel it coming, and before he knows it, ah, he's done. This is what the enemy does to us. He does not come at us with one big, bold temptation. No, he gives us small compromises that lead us to living on an edge. I have to sing, living on the edge. I've said that phrase like four times. And anyway, Aerosmith's on my mind. So there you go. I got it out. So let's let's look at this idea of having some moral margin. Here's how I'm going to define moral margin. It's having the space between your convictions and your temptations. Moral margin is having some space between your convictions and your temptations. The space between this, what I have, and what I need is having some space between he, me and my temptations. The scripture in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, Paul writes, he says, look, flee from sexual immorality. And then he goes into this diatribe about what sexual immorality does and what it is for you. But that one word at the beginning, flee is very, very key to understanding his approach to having moral margin. It's a Greek word that means to run away, to shun from, to escape, to distance one's self. Paul's not playing the same game. Can I do all these things and still get in? No, Paul says, look, if this is is something you want to avoid, you need to flee it. You need to run from it. You need to shun it. You need to create some distance between yourself and, and that thing. I've talked to oftentimes to repeat offenders that struggle with the same sin over and over and over and over again. And oftentimes repeat offenders of the same sin, they often think that the problem is the conviction. Well, maybe I don't need to really have that firm of a stance when it comes to that thing. Maybe I need to kind of loosen up and take the pressure off. Maybe I don't need that firm of a boundary with that conviction. Here's the thing. You don't need new convictions, okay? The convictions are not the problem. You don't need new convictions. You need God's convictions. Make sure that they are proper. And you need some courage to say no to temptation. That's why we eat up our margin a little at a time, one compromise at a time, we eat up our margin and then we find ourselves out here living on the edge of, with no moral margin, no escape room. And when temptation comes, we find ourselves teetering off the edge and we become a statistic or we become a story of, man, can you believe what Bob did? Can you believe what Jane did? Can you believe what Jim went through? We become a story around the office of some tragedy in our family, some tragedy at our workplace, some living tragedy of a mistake. Those people didn't find themselves there all of the sudden. No, they inched their way there, eating up their moral margin and found themselves out on the edge. Something came along, pushed them over, and that was that. But here's the thing. You may be listening to me today and you're like, Pastor Chris, hey, that sounds cool. Sounds great moral margin and all, but I'm not really into that sort of thing. I don't really need any moral margin. I like my life. Things are fine. So if you don't want any moral margin, so this, here's your opportunity. Uh, I want to give you three things. If you don't want any moral margin, here's some three tips for you. Number one, never think about the consequences, okay? If you don't want any moral margin, never, ever think about the consequences. This decision could ruin your life, but you don't need any of that negativity. So just avoid all of the consequences. The idea is just go live free. Do whatever your heart desires. Never, ever think about the consequences. If you don't want moral margin, don't think about it. Number two, if you don't want moral margin, never avoid dangerous places. Never avoid dangerous places. 1.30 a.m. at the bar, there ain't nothing good happening at that moment. And by, I hope you don't know from experience, but if you know from experience, ain't I right? right? There ain't nothing happening good at that time. 1.30 at the bar, midnight at your girlfriend's house. We're just watching a movie. It's just, we're just chilling. No, there ain't nothing good happening in that moment. Drifting down the ice cream aisle. Nothing good can happen from passing the Ben and Jerry's. 
Every once in a while, I want to see if, if Food Lion, if, if Shoppers, if, if Mars, I want to just see if they put Ben & Jerry's on sale. And if I bump into a two for six deal, maybe I'll pick one up for a special occasion. <laughs> Nothing good happens down there because they are always on sale. They will get you every single time. So if you don't want any moral margin, never avoid dangerous places. Just go dive, dive deep into the craziness. Number three, if you don't want any moral margin, never submit to accountability. You don't need the negativity of those know-it-all friends that are trying to help you out and keep you from destroying your life. You don't need any of that stuff, so avoid it like the plague. You do not need any accountability. But here's the problem with that plan. That if a temptation comes and you have lived according to these, not thinking about the consequences, always living in dangerous places, not submitting to accountability, if you live by those rules, you're going to find yourself right on the edge, if not already over. And when a true temptation comes, you become a statistic. You fall in, you lose your balance, one more temptation will push you over the edge. And that's how people lose their marriages. That's how people get fired from their job. That's how people find themselves in jail. That's how they get in trouble. When they've lived on the edge, because of one consequence at a time, one compromise at a time, and they find themselves with no moral margin, and then that moment comes, they have no escape room. They're hoping that God will bail them out. And he's saying, I gave you all of this escape room. You've already used it up. I love this scripture in Psalms 119. In the New Living Translation, it says, Joyful are people of integrity. Integrity sounds like a boring word, doesn't it? No? <laughs> so thank you. That's the right answer. <laughs> but just to be honest, I hear the word integrity. I'm like, that guy's lame, you know? But, but uh, David's right. No, no, no. Joyful are the people of integrity. Man, these people are having a blast who follows the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all of their hearts. Verse three, they do not compromise with evil. They do not compromise with evil and they walk only on his, God's paths. This makes a joyful life. When you are so far from falling down, falling off the edge of the mountain, when you are so far from that, that actually produces joy in your life. Woo, because you can actually walk with some freedom. You can walk just relaxing, knowing that you're not going to fall off the edge. You've got so much margin that even if you stumble just a moment, you're going to be okay. This actually produces joy. I don't know how many people I've talked to that's, that think joy is actually way over here on the edge. One foot in the world and one foot in the church. I got my sights on heaven, but I got my, my eyes on the earth, you know? I'm trying to experience all I can here and now, but still kind of reserve a ticket that if I died, Jesus is going to let me in. He's going to let me slide just kind of slide in. That doesn't produce joy. That actually produces anxiety. I grew up in an age of the church that at the end of every service, the question would pose, if you were to die right now. I was like, man, people are dying all the time. This guy's always asking this question. People must die at the end of service all, every week. I'm like, oh, am I missing that? You know what? If you were to die right now, where would you go? I was constantly posed with this question, and it actually produces anxiety in me. I thought, man, I grew up in church. I've said the prayer a thousand times. I went down and I prayed. I got prayed for. I prayed for other people. I was 12. I knew, like, all the scriptures. I could quote Psalms 23. I had all the Bible awards. And I'm freaking out, man. If I'm freaking out, everybody's got to be freaking out. It produces anxiety, like, man, am I going to get into heaven? Am I not? Am I a sinner? Am I not? No, it's craziness. I love how David says, the people who live by integrity, the people who don't compromise to evil, those are the ones that are actually in joyful. They're living at peace, knowing that they are secure in God. So how do we build some moral margin? Three quick ways. Number one, we have to get our thoughts on track. The first way to build moral margin is it begins with our thought life. Here are some thoughts 
that will chew up your moral margin, that will get you too close to the line. Here are some thoughts that you don't want to have. Number one, I deserve it. The I deserve it thought is a dangerous one. Here's another one. It's only one time. It's, it's just this one time. That'll get you too close to the line, falling over the edge. How about this one? That will never happen to me. Hey, never say never, my friend. That's a scary one. How about this one? I'm not actually hurting anybody. This isn't really, this isn't really hurting. What's the big deal? This isn't really hurting anyone. Here's another one. This is my favorite. It's not like I'm a pastor or anything. I love this one, and I'm going to talk to you just from personal experience. Someone will begin to talk to me about a movie. Oh, yeah. It's just like that one scene in Deadpool <laughs> where he says, and they look at me and they say, oh, yeah, never mind. So here's a couple things that go through my mind. If I can't see Deadpool, why are you seeing Deadpool, right? And it comes to this thought, like, well, I'm not like a pastor. What does that mean? I don't, I don't know what that means. And here's another thing that goes through my mind. Sometimes I'll quote movies that people put in the category of pastors shouldn't see, right? And I'll drop a quote, and people will be like, did you just say that? And they think, hey, you're a pastor. You're not, you're, not supposed to be seeing, you're not supposed to be seeing that stuff. This thought of I'm not like a pastor. I don't need to really live up to this, this level up here. That's your job, Pastor Chris. What in the world does that mean? I don't even know. We should all be striving to be as close to Jesus as possible, right? Anyway, it, was, it might have been a small soapbox. Last one, uh, thoughts that get you too close to the edge. Just don't get caught. Just don't get caught. Don't get caught looking. Don't get caught touching. Don't get caught fudging the reports. Just, just don't get caught and you'll be okay. Instead of just don't get caught, what if we said just don't? Right? If the thought goes through your head, just don't get caught, just shorten that up. Just, just don't. It's the easier way to go. Last one. It's only for a little while. It's more convenient this way. It's cheaper. If we do it this way, it's only, for, it's only for a little bit. Here's the last one for business owners. And even just employees, business is business. Church is church, all right? All the goody two-shoe Jesus stuff is over there, but business is business. Here's, here's the crazy thing. If when you leave this building, you're not a better employee for your company, if you're not a better boss for your team, if you're not a better owner for the company that you have started, we have failed as a church to connect the dots because what happens at work is still connected to what happens in this room. We're not Christians here and just normal people there. No, 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 no. We're believers. We're followers of Christ everywhere we go. It's the equivalent of Peter standing out there and the girl saying, hey, don't you know Jesus? And he's like, nah, I never knew the guy. Wouldn't only crucify Peter when he denies Jesus? We do the same thing if we enter our workplace and say, business is business. I'm leaving my faith at the door. Ugh, I didn't mean to go that heavy. I'm sorry. Number one, get your thoughts on track. Number two, let's keep moving along on how to build some moral margin in your life. Get busy living or get busy dying. If you want to build some moral margin in your life, get busy living or get busy dying. You have to get to work about God's business. Let me show you this verse, Romans chapter 6, 12 and 13. Paul says, look, therefore, don't let sin reign in your, your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. Verse 13, do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. God, here I am. What do you want me to do? As those who have been bought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness instruments instruments of righteousness offer yourselves your hands your feet your mouth your eyes your ears offer yourselves in any way possible god what do you want me to do where would you have me go jesus what, what would you call me to go do see here's the thing when you're busy working over here it's difficult to drift over there when your hands and your life is busy working over here for God's stuff, it's really difficult to go drifting over in a different direction towards where you shouldn't be. 
It's only when I'm bored, I'm tired, I have nothing on my calendar, do I usually get myself into trouble, right? But when I'm busy, when I know that I should be doing something, when I should be accountable, should be working for something, I don't even think about drifting over to do crazy stuff. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody done crazy stuff in the room? I just make sure I'm in the right company. Thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand, my friend. I only do crazy stuff when my mind is free. I have nothing on my agenda. I have no expectations on me. I just kind of wander and, and fall in. But, man, when I'm busy doing what God's called me to do, I don't even think twice about drifting into doing crazy stuff. Right? So get busy living. Get busy doing what God's called you to. Thirdly, last point this morning. If we're going to build moral margin, thirdly, we have to realize that there is a new line. That the line that we thought was drawn in the sand actually isn't the one we need to be paying attention to. When Jesus showed up on the scene, his big first sermon was called the Sermon on the Mount. It's recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And there's many times in that sermon Jesus says, look, you've heard it said that this, this, this. But I'm coming to tell you that this, this, this. He actually, he changes the game. He, he flips the script on these guys who've been living on the edge. They've been living according to this line of their actions. But Jesus says the line is actually way over there, my friend. He says about anger. You've heard it said that you shall not murder, which is true. He says, but I'm telling you, if you have anger in your heart, you've already murdered in here. He also says, look, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, which is true. You shouldn't do that. He says, but I'm telling you that if you've looked on someone lustfully with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with them in here. Jesus comes on the scene and says, look, the line is not over there. The line's way back here. The line of moral margin is not with your actions. The line actually begins in your heart condition. Far too often, Christians find themselves not committing the sins Scripture tells them to, but their heart condition is completely opposite. You got somebody, we've heard the story, somebody with a Jesus fish on their, the back of their car, but the first to cut you off in traffic, not let you merge in. What's your first thought? Nice Christian, <laughs> nice lover of Jesus, buddy. If I've cut you off, I don't have any Jesus fish on my truck, but I, if I've cut you off, I apologize because it, it happens. It happens before me. But we see people that, 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 that find themselves, they're, they're justified. They actually haven't committed any sins in their actions. But you can tell their heart condition is terrible, right? I think we've all met one of those people before. We may actually have been one of those people before. Jesus comes on the, scene, on the scene and says, look, the line of margin is not in your actions. It actually begins in your heart condition. And so this is how we're going to close out today. It's by taking an inventory of what's going on deep down in here. I haven't come to give you a set of rules. I haven't come to tell you that you know, if you're going to get into heaven, you got to do X, Y, Z, and you got to do these things. I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about any of that stuff that have to do with your actions at all. Actually, Scripture takes the pressure off. It says if you want to be saved, uh, living a life with Jesus, it actually begins deep down in, in here. It says if you believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Say, salvation will come. New life comes. You get a fresh start. You, uh, you become brand new all simply by something that happens on the inside. When our hearts are right, our actions will follow. It begins with our heart condition. So I'm going to ask you to take a posture of prayer this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed across the room. So we get ready to wrap up this morning. I'm going to ask you today to take an inventory of your heart. If you would call yourself a follower of Jesus, a Christian, a believer, a churchgoer, whatever the title you want to use, if you call yourself one of those, I want you to check your heart. Have you been living according to the, the rules as they are written, but 
fallen short as to where your heart should be? I want you to ask God and, and let him show you. But for those this morning that may not have a relationship with Jesus at all, you may have actually thought Christianity was just a list of, of do's and don'ts and rules. I come to tell you this morning, it's not. It's a heart check. And so today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'm actually going to give you an opportunity to begin one. And it's not by taking a class. It's not by filling out a paper. It's not by doing anything. It actually is just by believing in your heart. And so if that's you this morning, and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus today, in a second we're going to pray all across the room. Everybody in the room is going to pray this prayer. But before we do, this morning if that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up with nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you today, one, I want you to know that you are already loved more than you can ever imagine before you've done anything. Two, I want you to know there's nothing you could do to actually change that. That God loves you unconditionally. If that's you this morning, you want to begin a relationship with God. Three, just lift your hand up. Nobody looking around. And I thank you for that hand. Appreciate that. One, two. Awesome. Three. So cool. So awesome. It's the best decision you could ever make. All right, you can put your hands down. Everybody in the room, whether you raised your hand or you didn't, repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for making me new. I accept you into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and make me new. Today, I have a fresh start. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and celebrate with those people who made a commitment for Jesus. So I'll tell you, if you raised your hand and you made a commitment for Christ today, it is the best decision you've ever made. Or if you said that prayer and you didn't uh, feel like raising your hand up, it's still the best decision you've ever made. Before you leave, I want to encourage you to stop by this Fresh Start table, which is right over here. We have a small gift for you. Uh, it's a little bag. It's got a cool little booklet in it and some things that you really need to know uh, before you uh, start on this journey. Oh, there's the light. There she is, Ariana waving at us. It's uh, the best decision you made. Stop by and grab one. Uh, also, I'm going to hand it to Kimmy. She's going to uh, tell us what's up before we leave, and then I'm going to pray us out. Thanks, BC. Um, so if it was your first time today, we are super pumped that you came to spend your Sunday with us, and we have a gift for you. So first time guests, um, you're going to get a fancy mug to take home with you. So just picture the mug in your mind. <laughs> um, and then if it's your second time today, we have an equally awesome T-shirt to give to you. So stop by the Next Steps table and pick those up. And then lastly, um, we just wanted to thank you so much for all of your generous giving. So if uh, you're a regular attender, don't forget about the tithe boxes on the right-hand side as you leave. And then you can also give online or text to give. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Kimmy. And don't forget on your way out to grab these uh, Easter flyers to remind you and to remind uh, those around your friends and your family, also. Let me pray over you. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your grace and love for us, the unconditional love you have for us. Keep us, God. Give us the courage to go out and live how you would call us to from the heart out. We love you, Lord. Pray it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, love you guys. Have a great week.